Section 1 of G. K. Chesterton in the British Review. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton in the British Review by G. K. Chesterton. The True Failure of the Turk that huge and hundredfold pressure of popular speech and legend which is behind us all has nowadays to break through narrower and more oligarchic channels than perhaps ever before but it is still the best guide to good sense proverbs are nearly always more true than they look no man for instance until he has a dog of his own knows how true are the old phrases about a dog in the manger or let sleeping dogs lie but the echo of such ancient popular phrases is especially valuable in the case of ancient words whose meaning is now disputed, such as the word Christian. We know that Nietzsche said there was only one Christian and he was crucified, and some of the higher critics seem to have little with which to improve on it, except by suggesting that perhaps he wasn't. The situation really turns the Christians into a new sect with new dogmas hitherto unknown to Christendom. In about half of the British press today, the word Christian clearly has a sense quite vivid to those who so use it, but which those with other sympathies could only translate as something between cosmopolitan and meliorist, with a touch of Quaker. It is almost taken for granted that it was a water-drinker who turned water into wine, and an enemy of all smiting who smote on the very steps of the temple. Now, if turning from the use of the word by aristocrats like Tolstoy, or capitalists like Quakers, we ask ourselves how the word Christian is used by old tradition among apple women or charwomen, or draymen or dustmen, we shall find something that would surprise the eccentrics very much. We shall find the democracy using the word Christian in a sense which we can only say is something between sane and civilized. Where can I get Christian food? or when i get among christian folk are common in all the old popular talk and tales in no way concerned with religion there was indeed in all christianity an element of the democratic but in this aspect it was not individualistic nor even revolutionary it was rather a feeling of a sort of respectful egalitarianism that everybody ought to treat himself like everyone else and not have the impudence to love himself otherwise than as he loved his neighbor. Shakespeare has been called anti-democratic, because, like nearly all the European poets of all ages, he did one or two rhetorical exercises on the old theme of Odi Profanum. But the conversations of his clowns contain some of the most vivid traces of the wit and vitality of the popular Christian tradition. And in so far as it was a tradition of equality, it was faultlessly phrased by the grave-digger, and the more a pity that great folk should have countenance in this world to drown or hang themselves more than their even Christian. I do not think it was quite accidental that Shakespeare put in that grim qualification in this world, but the broad fact is that the word Christian is generally used by the populace in a sense even more apparently remote from religious definition than this, and commonly signifies that which is human normal social and self-respecting thus the modern idealist having put away war and wine will wear peasant clothes in imitation of tolstoy and part his hair in imitation of christ and walk shining with christian democracy and the democracy will look at him and say why can't he dress like a christian now just as i believe in putting this sort of preliminary popular test to the significance of the christian I should put a similar preliminary popular test to the significance of the word Turk. What does common language in quotation suggest that our fathers felt about a Turk? In the same sense that they felt Christian to mean the civilization in which they were equally recognized and were at home. If you had said to any fairly typical Englishman at the time, from Robin Hood to Thomas Hood, I want to introduce you to a Turk, what would have been the image in his mind? Or how far can the outlines of such an image be faintly traced from words that are really widely scattered among men? It is clear, I think, that the first note was struck right the identification of the people with their faith. 
I might rest this on the old ballads in which the Turkish knight is represented as worshipping Mahound, with a rabid regularity and consistency by no means emerging so clearly in the Christianity of his opponent. In some of the longer ballad epics of the Dark Ages, I think Mahound melted into a combination of Apollo and Apollyon, calculated to make the mythological brain real. But all these popular errors are no longer popular. A better instance can be found in the passage in the English prayer book, where the name Mahomet occurs in none of its forms. Not even the emancipated will be annoyed to hear in the calendar of saints, but where strictly spiritual errors are summed up under the heads of Jews, Turks, infidels, and heretics. In cold theology, I conceive all could have been covered by saying infidels and heretics. But two of the most powerful and picturesque realities this world has ever seen force themselves like wedges between the other words of the sentence. The Jews were the absorbing problem inside Christendom. The Turks were the absorbing problem outside Christendom. The first problem was economic. The second was military. But it is most certainly a tribute to two great religions that they had to be specially mentioned in a definition which would, logically speaking, have covered them completely. This at least is clear about our fathers when they talked about Turks. They knew there was another great religion in the world. The next idea about the Turk that emerges everywhere in popular expression is the idea of his despotism. The 18th century contained many crowned heads in Europe who were absolute in every apparent sense. Many of them were absolute in an absolute sense. I mean that awful sense that the king denies all invisible power above him, as well as all visible power below. The atheist emperor of Austria, the atheist empress of Russia, the atheist king of Prussia, were all sovereigns who, in the most literal and logical sense of the words, neither feared God nor regarded man. They believed in undivine right, which sits on a higher throne than divine right. And yet throughout this period of rationalist autocracy, we have abundance of proof that the Turk was felt to be absolute and irresponsible in a sense utterly beyond the European phrase, like as despotic as the Grand Turk, or we might as well be living under the Grand Turk, are thickly scattered over the whole of that period when Europe itself was ruled by all that Europeans have ever experienced as despotism. Right or wrong, the popular idea, plainly, was that in the West the rulers could make a scourge out of wild and woodland rods, but that you had to live in the East to make the whip out of scorpions. There went along with this, in popular language, a strong impression that the Turk was not fierce, but ferocious. Frenchmen, Scotchmen, Spaniards, Irishmen were all very fierce on occasion. Even Englishmen were fierce on occasion. But through a thousand legends and links of tradition, there lingers the idea that the Turk was really terrible and atrocious. The more flippant the examples, the more obvious it is that the mind was full of the fact. When it says in that splendid ballad of Sally in our alley, my master comes like any Turk and bangs me most severely. It is quite clear that the balladist attributed to the Turk a disproportion in the habit of human banging quite beyond the Christian limits of that duty or pleasure. And when Thomas Hood, perhaps a hundred years after, instinctively uses the phrase, an ode to be a slave, along with the barbarous Turk. He concedes the main point, which is the barbarism. Broadly, our fathers certainly felt the Turk as something destructive, obstreperous, and unmanageable. Indeed, nurses used to talk about young Turks long before the phrase began to be used as a description of aged Jews. I do not profess at this point to have proved anything, except that a certain suspicion of one society was very widely distributed through another, and crops up after centuries in the strangest way. That suspicion was doubtless one-sided, but it was not sectional. The East was East and the West was West, but it was the whole democracy of the West. One half of the world did not know how the other half lived, but the half was a whole half, and the impression left upon thousands of billions, rich and poor, seems to have roughly amounted to these three things. That a Turk was a man with a strange religion. That a Turk was arbitrary beyond the common sin of kings. And that a Turk was uncivilized. That is as much of the popular tradition as we can get. 
and I incline to think that it is as much of the truth as we can get. In short, I would propose to maintain the following very unfashionable opinions. First, that the Turk has ultimately failed because his religion is false. Second, that he has failed because his politics were imperial. And third, that he has failed because imperialism is not only in its nature uncivilized, but in its nature uncivilizable. The great powers, the great newspapers, the great capitalists who can control both, who can control everything on earth except a man with moderate courage, have been talking for some time past about the carnage in the Balkans. They are rather inclined to take up the argument that as much blood has been shed by Servians fighting Bulgars as was shed by Turks massacring Armenians. The fundamental answer is that bloodshed has not been the crime of the Turk. Nay, if anything, it has been his plea in mitigation. There is an equally fundamental answer for any one with a sense of dignity and delicacy, that the most bestial battle is mutual, while the mildest massacre is not mutual. But the vital matter is the mistake about the true failure of Turkey. The Turks were always courageous and cruel, and it is in no sense outside experimental human psychology that their rivals should sometimes be equally cruel. Now they have had the sense to be equally courageous. The existence of courage gives us no reason at root for retaining the Turk. The existence of cruelty gives us no reason at root for deserting either the Bulgar or the Serb. The whole difference lies much deeper, and whether the modern world likes it or not, it is a difference of religion. The Christian enthusiasts who said Mohammed was Antichrist were not narrow or irrational nor were they doing the great prophet any moral wrong. It was always a part of the true legend of Antichrist that he should shine with all the heathen virtues, and especially the most austere ones. But the vital aspect in which Mohammed may really be taken as a sort of type of Antichrist is this, that his whole faith is founded on a furious denial of the idea of incarnation. This is the key to the Turk everywhere and in everything. For this reason he goes to war with statues and slays them like living foes. For this reason, with all his early culture in mathematics and medicine, he would sometimes, like the Caliph Omar, fly into a mystical passion and utter in flame his fury even against books. For this reason he will have no human or animal form in his most ornate and instructed designs. The flames that wreathed themselves roaring around the library of Alexandria only spoke aloud the same word of woe and denunciation, which is said as clearly by the arabesques and traceries that read themselves in silence on any quiet curtain or sunny wall. The thing that is really at the back of all Turkey's massacres can be seen by staring at a Turkey carpet. It is this, again, that makes the literature of such civilizations so much better in a decorative sense than it is in a realistic sense. The Arabian Nights is probably the best novel in the world, if we are asking for stories. It is probably the worst novel in the world, if we are asking for people. The whole of those thousand and one nights might almost have been read by Scheherazade from the complex yet featureless scrap of carpet on which she sat to tell them. The faces of the heartless princesses and the veiled incalculable kings were like the half-human faces the eye can find in a wallpaper. The whole masterpiece is like a masterpiece of oriental embroidery, glorious with all God's colors, intricate with all man's crafts, as melodious as music, as strategic as chess, and as inhuman as the howling deserts out of which its spirit came. Lastly, it is this that has prevented the Turk from being a ruler as well as a conqueror of men. It is this much more than his cruelties, that which he would call his hatred of idolatry, that which I call his horror and fear of incarnation, forbids him to fix even his lesser affections frequently upon sacred images, sacred arts, sacred individuals. Of necessity, therefore, it makes him colder than other men to the idea of sacred stones and of sacred soils. Hence his grasp has always slipped on the great fundamental fact of all political order or fellowship and the rational root of government. For that fundamental fact is land, the good red earth of which we men were made. 
The true comparison between the Turks and, let us say, the Servians is not to be found by counting heads when they are broken or noses when they are cut off, especially among armed populaces inflamed by centuries of shame and terror. The fundamental fact to start with is that the Servians care about Servia. The Turk does not care about Turkey. At the most, he cares about being a Turk. And even that, of course, can be more correctly stated by saying that he cares about being a Moslem, or true believer. The quarrel is incurably a religious one, not only because his creed differs from our creed, but because he differs from us in having nothing else but a creed. It is the essence of the incarnation idea that it believes in relics, in bodily and materialistic modes of grace, and among others the mode of locality and landscape. It is not a mere coincidence that the Crusades, the revolutions against Islam which shook but never broke it, were not merely for the imposition of a system, but for the recovery of a site. The sense of the sanctity of the land was crystallized in the conception of a holy land, and this sense of the local genius and the local shrine shines through all the shifting ambitions of the Middle Ages, and softens the stranger's usurpations with a certain magic of nationality. Charlemagne was a Frenchman before there was any France. A hundred German professors have died in agonies, trying to get us all to call him Karl. Alfred would not or could not make Wessex England, but he made Wessex English. Robert Bruce was not in the modern sense a Scotchman at all, but though he was not a Scotchman, he was a Scotch patriot. He felt in his big bones all those generations of narrow and noble nationalists who were to brag of his name. William the Conqueror slipped often enough in the slime and blood of the earlier and more brutal Middle Ages as he slipped on the shore of Sussex when he landed from his ship. But he had this instinct of this sacrament of the soil, for he arose with his hands full of earth, and said that it was his land. That is why his monarchy struck root as an English oak, and in a little time had forgotten France. But when the Turk has re-arisen in his many splendid resurrections, there never was anything that stuck to his hands but blood. Doubtless all such generalizations are subject to exceptions, but to those slender exceptions which really prove the rule. No part of humanity is wholly inhuman on any point, even a point in which it does not specialize. There are Jewish prize-fighters, there are Prussian humorists, there are English rebels. The Moslem civilizations yield here and there to the human temptation of having holy cities and special places for prayer. But it is not, as compared with other religions, the special character of the religion. The religion, as a religion, is rather one which drives men forth to newer and newer lands, so that nation after nation flies back behind their horse hoofs. The wonderful work they have done in history has always been a work of external conquest, never a work of reconstruction or return. In moments wholly devoted to religion, which is itself a desire for the home of the human heart, in sacred matters such as death, the Moslem remembered, as all men remember, the things from which he came. But this never altered the external nature of his imperial and insatiable policy. His dead face was turned dutifully towards Mecca, but his face alive was always turned towards Vienna. I suppose it is a mere fancy to observe that the bird called the eagle is the symbol of imperialism, but in spite of the just and splendid associations of that symbol, I cannot prevent myself from having a secret pleasure in the fact that there never has been an eagle on the English shield. Leopards or lions, for there seem to be some dispute about which they are, at least walk about like men and cattle, and therefore must have some vague environment which may loosely be called their country. But the eagle can claim only two things, a barren crag and the whole world. I do not want either of them. Islam reminds me very much of an eagle. At its best, it is free and proud in the purity of the heavens. At its worst, it is a thief and a robber and a murderer from the beginning. But whether in good or evil, the eagle knows nothing of the earth. So the Turk knows nothing of the earth. He knows no more of the land on which he descends than one of the earliest balloonists. He fails in the first talent of a successful invader. He cannot let himself be conquered by a conquered country. He can be of no use in a farmyard. 
because eagles lay no eggs that are useful to anybody but themselves. The Turks cannot put the eagle on their flag because of the veto on all animal form of which I have spoken. But not being allowed the hooked-beaked bird that rides the heavens, they have chosen the moon that rides the heavens, at its very sharpest and hookiest. But I always thought of Turkish rule as a still swarm of predatory birds spread over a whole landscape and so still that they might be mistaken for the leaves on the trees but they will vanish and the trees will remain in short the turk is nomadic in the true sense not so much in going everywhere as in coming from nowhere he had to have an empire because he had not got a country and in this respect his imperialism has failed so as to be a warning to all imperialism the vital error in imperialism is this that it cannot make up its mind between two inconsistent ideas, the solidification of a nationality and the triumph of an imperial people. The ancient Romans made the Gauls Roman citizens. The more modern Americans made the African American slaves. But an empire always attempts to fuse the conquered man and still make him feel inferior, to ask him to die for a nationality he may not claim. We have made this mistake in its most ghastly form in ireland the french republic may have told the breton to leave off being a breton but it told him to be and call himself a frenchman we have told the irishman to leave off being an irishman but we never had the moral courage to let him call himself an englishman as matters stood for something like two hundred years the irishman was a liar when he called himself english and a traitor when he called himself irish the central sin and weakness of imperialism is not making everybody alike spreading a flat and vulgar similarity as in the first and the most instinctive criticism of it the sin and weakness of imperialism is that the imperialist seeks to spread the similarity to others and yet retain the superiority to himself and it weakens in the most inmost parts as do all things that go against the reason in god and man this is, of course, exhibited in the gigantic parody of imperialism by which we have been warned in the Turk. He wanted all his subject peoples to belong to him altogether. He had not the slightest aspiration to belong to them at all. He wanted to wear the great black mountain like an eastern cap, and the great Greek islands like the fringe of an eastern robe. But he wanted every one to remember that the body is more than raiment, and the Turk more than his subjects. He was so satisfied with being a Turk that he never made any turkey. When, in his heroic retreat, he barred himself behind the gates of Constantinople, he had taken refuge in a foreign city. For the imperialist is an alien everywhere. Cursed is he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. Cursed because he removes his own. And thirdly, the root of error of all such imperialism lies in the fact that Hood and a hundred Christian writers earlier had caught, that the Turk, good or bad, is to this day the barbarous Turk. He had the blind, unbroken, one-sided vanity of the savage or the spoilt child. Cedar of Lebanon, that God hath not broken, as Matthew Arnold's hero said of a similar oligarch. At the bottom of all such superior and, as I should say, satanic visions of empire, there is an idea that it is babyish and half-witted, which I can only call the non-reciprocal idea. I kill you, but you do not kill me. Your property is mine, because all goods are held in common. My property is not yours, because my father gave it me. Whenever you smell the savor and presence of that position, you are justified quite literally in calling it half-witted, for it is really using only one lobe of the brain. It is really reading only the one half of the equation. It produces on a civilized and responsible mind much the same effect that is produced by listening to a friend talking on the telephone. It brutally bisects the human brain, and it is because all pride reposes on that loss of reciprocity, and I do not care whether you call it equality or not, that pride is a mental weakness. It is because all imperialism reposes on pride, that imperialism is a national weakness. It does not matter much whether a nation is large or small, so long as its citizens are citizens of the same size, and the nation has some boundaries as somewhere. I think it is an injustice to the Turks to call them unprogressive. I think they have always believed in progress, 
especially progress westwards. I think they have always sought progress, their own progress. Their very symbol is a symbol of progress, the crescent, the growing thing. But they swore by the moon, the inconstant moon, and the waxing crescent did what progressive things always do. It waned. G. K. Chesterton End of Section 1《Section Two of G. K. Chesterton in the British Review. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by T. R. Love of Pleasant Hill, California. G. K. Chesterton in the British Review by G. K. Chesterton. The Exclusiveness of Journalists. Most of us, especially most of us who are journalists, have realized by this time that the newspaper makes its appeal to a very narrow circle. If my fellow journalists prefer me to say a very select circle, I will do so. Anyhow, the newspaper is not any of the things which it is generally denounced for being, particularly in the newspaper. It is not the creation of democracy. It is not the mental pablum of the masses. Why can't they say pasture? It is not specially suited to the man in the street any more than to the man in the forest or the man in the mountains. And above all, it is not suited to the average of mankind counted anyway, up or down or back or forwards or zigzag or roundabout or by any other method by which one could come to the totality of a body of separate figures. It is not free speech. It is something much more like a secret language, especially the sort of secret language that is invented by children. Consider that the human multitude consists of many generations of two sexes, though this is denied by some. Of every age and instant, from the cradle to the grave, of every kind of color and race, including some between whom it requires the whole violent strength of the most vivid Christianity to overcome a bodily abhorrence, and then compare the popularity of the most popular newspaper with the popularity of almost anything else. Take the chance you would have among all those cross-currents of contrast with nothing but a newspaper, and compare it with the chance you would have with almost any of the older institutions of human pleasure. Compare it with the chance you would have with a fairy tale, or a brass band, or a hymn, or a toast, or a curse, or even a smoking room story. I am fairly certain you would find that the language of the modern newspaper was the most limited of human languages, the most unintelligible of human languages, and therefore, I need hardly say, the most aristocratic. I have spoken of an average, therefore I will really take average examples. I will not ransack the rest of the press for the infinite riches of example or coincidence which it contains. I will take one page of The Star, November 11, 1913, which I have just opened as an excuse for putting off the duty of writing this article. I also opened it to find out whether it was really true that the only political idealism left in England is now to be found on the stock exchange. It seems to be a fact, though a queer fact. But I take these two or three headlines quite accidentally and fairly from the page at which I happen to be staring. They are all within something like six inches of each other. I ask if there was ever a language less understanded of the people, a language more certain to be misunderstood by anybody who happened to be a little older, or a little younger, or a little less or a little more educated, or a little strange to the society, or a little set in the habits of sex or trade, than the secret language of the newspaper. I take first the headline, more lightning strikes at London Music Halls. I pass over for the moment the fascinating and philosophical question of the phrase music hall. 
Say the same two words in almost any other language in Europe, and it may mean a place where Bach and Grieg are performed in a profound and classical silence. But we will, as I say, pass that. More lightning strikes at London Music Halls. My grandfather or great-grandfather, your grandson or great-grandson, would almost certainly read those English words as meaning more music halls in London have been struck by lightning. Before the flying Argo fades away, I hasten to say that it does not mean this. It means that a number of poor men have remembered that they are free men and had the sense to assert it suddenly. That is what is meant by lightning. It is an adjective, but only a very narrow circle of the initiated could possibly guess it was. Just above these words appears in yet larger letters the simple statement, Down fiddles. Consider how slight a separation from the slang of newspapers would be needed to make even that mean three or four different things. It might mean that a person named Down was practicing the violin. It might mean that a cargo of very valuable violins had arrived from County Down. It might mean that some haughty aristocrat like Tolstoy, who seems to have thought music immoral, had said, Down, fiddles! As another aristocrat might say, Down, Fido! Exactly how large a proportion of what I mean by the democracy, the human family on this earth, would be certain to find among all these meanings the meaning that was meant. How many men, white, black, and yellow, how many old men, how many women, how many children, how many tramps, how many monks, how many men soaked in some art or hobby, would be certain to know that down fiddles was a joke founded on down tools, and that down tools is a political abbreviation for throw down your tools and do no more work till your demands are granted. Now those two journalistic phrases are exactly one above the other and occupy no more than the space of three penny stamps. I could roam all over the page, the page I have accidentally opened, for illustrations of the same thing. The paragraph just above is headed, Richie Beat Cross. It might mean anything. It might be the full name of some particular gentleman. It might mean that a Mr. Richie Beat was cross. It might mean that a Mr. Richie had been beaten until he was cross. Take away the key of the closest contemporary knowledge, and that the knowledge of a very narrow circle, and the sentence is untranslatable and unintelligible in a sense that the darkest Greek or the densest Latin have never been through all their 3,000 years. It is the obvious answer to say that the daily paper is meant to be daily. Everyone, it will be said, understands it on Monday, and it is more lost than the lost books of Tacitus on Tuesday. I do not think this answer has the key to the strange secret language of journalism. I am a member of the public. I am as daily as anybody else, whom God makes every morning and strikes down every night. I am as much everybody as anybody. And I here confess that even when I could believe the whole of a newspaper, I could only understand about an eighth of it. I went swiftly to my own scrap of slang, to my own secret language, poets or political idealism, or news of small nations, or whatever it might be. I passed the solid columns about railways or the Royal Society as I passed the solid columns of some colonnade I paced in a boyish excitement. I think I should always have understood the idea of down tools, even in the form of down fiddles, or down stethoscopes, or down curling tongs, or whatever it might be. But that is because I always believed in the strike, the true Christian weapon of revolt, since it contrives at one blow to respect property and to scorn it. But even then, the very next paragraph might puzzle me. The Richie who beat Cross might still beat me. It seems likely, moreover, 
that a certain abruptness in this use of words is connected with the specialism of which I speak, as if the particular writer knew he would only be read by one particular kind of reader. It has the confidence of a private telegram, and therefore its brevity. People will understand, or they will not read it. They will not suppose, let us say, that the admirable novelist of old Kensington or any of her connections have been beating cross. Or if the name Hurst appears in a certain way in a certain part of the paper, it will mean the cricketer and not the very able economist. It will mean the journalist has become exclusive in the worst sense of the word. I have seen the change in the course of a very short and extremely unobservant career. I can recall the days when an editor, even a liberal editor, really took the idea of liberty for granted, when he was a censor only with reluctance, when he explained, as from one human being to another, that this or that must, after all, be blacked out. The modern editor is as unconcerned about liberty as he is concerned about libel. He creates the whole paper by selection, as a work of art is created. When he wields the black brush, he is not a censor, but a black and white artist. He abolishes a truth as Turner abolished a tower, because it did not suit him. He plunges a whole people in darkness, as Rembrandt would plunge a whole people in darkness, to show the glint of some special steel or gold. He effaces the face of a man as Whistler effaced the face of a woman by broad, straight scratches, so that it may not interfere with the important modern matters of attitude and costume, which seem to be almost the most important modern matters. Any casual painter poising his brush over his palette between French ultramarine and Prussian blue, has no cooler hesitation, has no clearer personal decision than the ordinary English editor when he decides on his journalistic picture. He will decide as calmly on French ultramontism as on French ultramarine or on Prussian bloodshed as on Prussian blue. Now this is the first great problem about modern journalism, and to which I shall devote two articles after the present one. Journalism is not vulgar, it is fastidious. It is not popular, it is exclusive. It gives tips, but the tips are unintelligible to you and me. It gives political advice, but the advice is palpable nonsense to you and me. It gives literary and ethical advice, but these are obviously intended for those already initiated. In another article, I hope to initiate many more. G.K. Chesterton End of Section 2section three of G. K. Chesterton in the British Review. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton in the British Review by G. K. Chesterton. The Silence of Journalists. Modern journalism, as I pointed out last month, is, in its nature, fastidious and selective, especially the sort of journalism generally thought vulgar and full of license. The yellow press is as artificial a work of art as the yellow book, and as artistic. And the artistic effect it aims at is not music, but silence. If anyone is so paradoxical as to say there can be no such thing as a noisy silence, I can only refer him to the descriptions of the silence in nature as it is described in numberless novels and poems, a silence broken only by the crash of waves or the bellowing of bulls or the distant trumpeting of elephants or any other factor needed for complete silence. In any case, it is very possible to be verbally talkative while being spiritually silent. A conjurer while doing his patter, is verbally talkative, though spiritually silent. His main purpose is to make men ignore things, and the main purpose of the modern newspaper 
is to make men ignore things. I mean that the object is to make men ignorant. Ignorant of something important. While they are interested and even learned in some things entirely trivial. The rabbits come out of the hat because we look at the hat and not at the hands. The conjurer is silent, though he is talking all the time. The same description applies precisely to the modern journalist. It is very difficult indeed to define the nature of this distraction, to remember all the patter that has pleased us at one time or another. It is very much more difficult to analyze the moral element that makes such things possible. Those of us who have had the pleasure of arguing with an intellectual modern lady have probably been puzzled to name the nameless quality of sex by which she seemed to be outside the law as well as inside it. Broadly, you might say that she not only refuses to listen to what you say, but she refuses to listen to what she says. But indeed, it is more subtle than this. It is a kind of brilliant blindness, a kind of agile obstinacy that is not at all appropriate to the discussion of any definite point of truth. In the last analysis, it can best be compared with the old legal dilemma about refusing to plead. I do not for a moment suggest that these ladies should have heavy weights placed on their chests until they do plead, though whether I suggest it or not, my suffragette friends will say I did. One of them recently declared, as I understand the declaration, that I thought no young lady could avoid my besieging attentions or resist my marvelous fascinations unless she could brandish the terrible instrument called a vote. But I touch on this elusive quality only because it is the one parallel I can suggest to the singular spirit that has taken hold of the modern press. The press still goes in, somewhat cautiously, for what it calls correspondence. I wish it would go in for another and more essential quality, which I might call respondence. I mean the quality that would instinctively react upon any protest made against it. I mean the impulse to reply, as men do when they are rung up on the telephone or struck smartly on the tip of the nose. I know nothing of psychology or medicine, but I think there must be a word for the responsive faculties of the brain and body, those beautiful faculties that make us hit at the moment the man who has hurt us, instead of going on progressive principles and hitting somebody a long time afterwards who has never hurt us at all. Now, in that quality, whether we call it sensibility or sense, whether we call it being spiteful or being spirited, whether we call it pride or self-examination, whether we call it justice or revenge, all this is apparently impossible to the modern newspaper. It cannot hit back when it is hit. It cannot listen or reason or even to unreason. It cannot answer the plainest question if it is plainly asked. The old Victorian idea was that England was free because anybody could write a letter to the Times. But anybody cannot. The great newspapers sort and sift their letters more carefully every day. Now, in this matter, the common advertisements on the hoardings are much more honest than the daily papers. The advertisers used to say, don't look at this, obviously meaning that we should look at it. But the modern journalist goes a step beyond this imposture and misleading of the public. He says, do look at this, because he wants you not to look at something else. I give an example in passing out of the events that have been going on before us. A recently elected member of parliament, a most excellent man in private life, was photographed in the press in some five or fifteen or five hundred different attitudes, and was enforced and reinforced with perpetual headlines saying, Home Rule the Issue. Thus, if in one snapshot he was lifting both hands, it was in sheer horror at Home Rule. If he was lifting one hand, it was in solemn warning against Home Rule. If he was giving his hands a rest, he was simply paralyzed by the distinct prospect of home rule. If he had been snapshotted in the act of hitting the table, which many orators have done, no doubt he would be hitting home rule. Or, if he had been snapshotted in the act of falling under the table, 
which many orators have also done, he would be sinking under the unendurable catastrophe of home rule. I should think it very probable, since the man was a sensible man, I know him but slightly, that he talked about more important things, or, at least, things more important for Englishmen. But the essence of the truth is this, that the journalists who wrote those words, home rule the issue, cared less about Ireland than I do, and therefore infinitely less than any Irishman must. Home rule the issue, translated into plain English, simply meant Marconi, not the issue. And that candidate, who was photographed in all those attitudes, had actually promised his home rule opponent not to mention an Italian surname. In my last article, I pointed out that modern journalism is an aristocratic thing. Its object is not to include all kinds, but rather to exclude them. In this article, I wish to point out that its object is not to excite the public, but rather to soothe the public. This is, of course, the explanation of the unintelligible nonsense that appears in so large a part of the press. If you say, hey diddle diddle, as a lullaby, it will, very probably, lull. If you say, hey diddle diddle, as the last news from the war or the stock exchange, it will disappoint many. Hey diddle diddle means rather more than home rule the issue, for any man with the faintest patriotic feeling about the present state of purely English politics. But whichever form the words we happen to prefer, they are both meant for lullabies. Now, the essential fact about journalism nowadays is that it never by any chance publishes anything that could possibly wake people up. One paper did indeed invent a massacre in China that never happened. But then it was in China, and the typical modern journal is mistress of herself, though China fall. But the general journalistic effort, in the existing state of affairs, is to underrate the interest of what is going on. Anyone who has been at an election, or a battle, or even at the maneuvers, knows how much more human is the reality than the report. So all modern politics is a sham fight, but even a sham fight is more genuine than a sham report of a sham fight. The lie that knows itself to be a lie is very nearly the truth. Thus, the very cynicism, which is now the main mark of the governing class, makes it a little livelier than it is made in the pomposities of the press. Even statesmen are not such fools as they look, in newspaper portraits especially, and even Westminster is not so gray as it is painted. It should be noted that to this supreme necessity of tact and the soothing of souls, the journalist will sacrifice even journalism. He would rather make a story totally unintelligible than make it too exciting. It is often asked in a supercilious manner by those who wish to teach humanity but refuse to learn from it why the reading public rushes for the news of murders and such practical matters, and why the plain man in a tavern or a tram would rather talk about Dr. Crippen than Dr. Clifford. The light-minded, among whom I will never be numbered, may be content to reply that Dr. Crippen is the more interesting of the two. But indeed, there is a better answer, or at least a more delicate one. One reason, at least, while the average man reads the news of a murder trial, such as the Crippen case, with some care and reflection, is this, that it is one of the very few forms of news which is told sufficiently truthfully for him to be able to make head or tail of it. If we still had such an occasion as a state trial, that is, if an important man could be impeached nowadays for treason or sedition or sorcery or blasphemy, no doubt most of our journalists would be as confused and as confusing as they were over the Marconi Committee. But nowadays, all that the old-fashioned sentimentalist felt about the impossibility of laying his hand upon a lady, the modern journalist feels about laying it on a gentleman. So democratic is the age that I gravely doubt whether Lord Mohun or the Marquise de Brinvilliers would now be brought to trial at all. But the plutocracy that controls our press has no particular reason for suppressing what happened between Crippen and his unhappy wife. For the reader of the newspaper, therefore, 
things became, for the first time, clear and connected in the printed page. Reality almost becomes as sane and credible as romance. When a rich man is concerned, the story is like a three-volume novel, of which we have only the second volume. Its only resemblance to Melchizedek is in being without beginning or end. Or it is like a novel I once read by one of our wealthiest and most prolific novelists, in which the name of the heroine was calmly altered in the middle of the book. But the story of Crippen, though a horrible story, was a story, and the clear recounting of it was a work far more worthy of the dignity of the human intellect than the average shuffling leading article or truncated foreign news. It is true that this irrational secrecy, like all irrational things, sometimes recoils on itself and produces effects opposite to those which it perhaps intends. This can be curiously noted in the case which is most difficult to discuss, the question of decorum and reticence in certain dangerous elements of life. I should say that most of the journalists who deal with divorce or the crime passional probably try to make the topic decent. But their test of decency seems to me very strange. They seem to think that no harm can be done by 40 or 50 material details of criminality so long as they do not accuse the criminal of his crime. These people are always talking of the effect upon the young. I think most of us who have been young will agree that no great harm would have been done to us by the mention of some monstrosity by its old, plain Latin or legal name, which we should not only not understand, but not specially want to understand. But great harm might have been done to us by leaving us to get hideous hints out of a senseless and brainless story and wonder what deviltry might be done with a door key and a cab stand or with a policeman and a postcard. But compare with a case like that of Crippen, the comparatively poor man who is almost alone punished in our community, any case in which the political passions of any ruling groups are concerned. Compare the accounts we got of the murder charge against Crippen with the accounts we got of the murder charge against Bayliss. The matter is repulsive, but relevant. In the Crippen case, everything turned on a minute scar, of which we were given the most minute details, rightly or wrongly, and which we were expected to study through every loathsome transfiguration of surgery or putrefaction, though it was not inflicted by the murderer, but was only an indirect piece of evidence against him. In the case of the poor boy at Kiev, there were something like thirty separate scars, all of which were inflicted by the murderer, whoever he was, and the number and position of which were not the chief point, but really the only point in the whole business. Yet most of the English papers, particularly those theoretically dedicated to the worship of liberty, said next door to nothing about the chief point. We heard from time to time that something had been contradicted, something we had never heard said. We heard that a German doctor, whom we did not know, had a low opinion of a Russian doctor whom we had not been allowed to hear of. The correspondents could not tell a truth on Tuesday without practically admitting that they had suppressed a truth on Monday. They could not even rejoice in the Russian jury's justice without virtually confessing their own past injustice. All sorts of weird motives were attributed to the jury that acquitted the man, except indeed the quaint thought, which I entertain, that they acquitted Bayliss because he was innocent. But if twelve British pressmen had been as enlightened and civilized as those twelve peasants, we might have opened a new world, might have really understood Israel, or understood Russia. As it is, we were hurriedly told that there was no such thing as ritual murder, the one thing that was not proved. The rest was silence. And the creation of a silence is the aim of journalism. End of section 3「Section 4 of G. K. Chesterton in the British Review. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton in the British Review 
by G. K. Chesterton. The Unworldliness of Journalists Every kind of church has been charged with being worldly, nor will this charge be denied by anyone who believes that there has been any church in the world. But there is a fact that strikes me as far more fascinating and queer than the fact that the church is worldly. I mean the fact that the world is unworldly. I mean the fact that the world always manages to muddle its own secular aim even more than any of the great religions have muddled their religious aim. I mean the fact that businessmen are unbusinesslike. Publishers, for instance, have not the faintest idea of whether an author's work will sell. They have to ask another author, temporarily disguised as a reader. I mean the fact that sportsmen are unsportsmanlike. Nobody would, in fact, bet a waistcoat button that a thousand sportsmen would sacrifice their own interests to the sport, any more than a thousand chapel goers would sacrifice theirs to the chapel, if so much. I mean the fact that statesmen are unstatesmanlike. Democracy has passed much of its time in producing aristocrats as the best people, and aristocrats have passed nearly all their time in proving that they are not the best people. I mean the fact that science, left to itself, tends to be more and more unscientific, that law, left to itself, tends to be more and more lawless, People talk about the failure of Christianity. Christianity, in a sense, expected failure. By its first dreadful gestures, it dedicated itself to failure. But compared with all the pagan and practical experiments of this world, Christianity is a colossal scoop. The other cases are not merely instances of worldly failure but of the failure of worldliness. And of all these, there is no case stranger or stronger than the case of the journalist who cannot even keep a journal. He is unworldly. He simply does not know what happens from day to day. We are concerned here with no complaint that journalism is not literature. Our complaint is that journalism is not journalism. We can leave aside all the criticisms, right or wrong, which in earlier decades described journalism as pert or prying or vulgarly intimate. It may be that the journalist was once the early bird that caught the worm, and it may be that the worm is no fit breakfast for a gentleman. But at this particular minute by the clock, I strongly asseverate that the journalist is not the early bird, but the late bird, in both senses of the word. He is the late bird not only in the sense that he has not killed the worm, but in the sense that he is killed himself. And the result has been what should, I suppose, be expected on strict evolutionary principles, that the worms of this world are having an exceedingly good time. They have waxed so large and wound about so widely as to recall those colossal worms which, in the doubtful tongues of the Dark Ages, seem to have corresponded to the serpent of Eden and the dragon of St. George. Broadly and abandoning metaphor, the journalist has wholly failed to be useful even in what were regarded as his base uses. It is not necessary to say that he is a failure as a judge, a failure as a tribune, or even a failure as a demagogue. He is a failure as a spy. He is a failure as an eavesdropper. He is a failure as a scandalmonger. He is a failure as a coward and deserter, 
bringing the first news of a defeat. He does not bring the news. He does not know the news. Both the politicians and the populace are doing more and more without the papers. When Mr. Balfour said he never read the papers, it was regarded as a remote and aristocratic affectation, but it was probably the most popular and democratic thing he ever said in his life. I do not say, of course, that journalists do not let me know some things quicker than I should have heard them in any other way, but I do say that their primary thought at present is rather slowness in selecting the news than quickness in imparting it. That which the organization provides for, that which the machinery achieves, is not that I shall hear one fact early tomorrow, though I may, but that I shall not hear five other facts till tomorrow week, and shall not hear fifteen other facts at all. But over and above this, there is the third point with which I am concerned in this third article, that not only do journalists conceal the truth, but the truth is very largely concealed from them. This is the reason why, even in the squalid subsidence of the modern press, newspaper editors are still nicer men than newspaper proprietors. The case can be best tested by the particular sort of news that obviously ought to be new. There is a sort of journalism which carries on in a less polished style the tradition of truth and the world. It is avowedly gossip, or rather, it is avowedly rumor. It professes to be the latest from the racing stables, the latest from the green room the latest from the clubs. It is avowedly cautious because of its audacity. It hints a doubt and hesitates dislike. The comment is not so much a criticism. It is rather a sort of frivolous prophecy. In these little paragraphs in the flashy society papers, we ought to find the last whisper of novelty, if we find it anywhere. People who are worldly, and even wickedly worldly, might at least know the world. They do not. Their whispers are not whispers, but snores. Snores of sleepers who have slept for a hundred years. The men who write these things know less of the things than the men who read them. The old idea was that a book, or anything like a book, had something of the quality of a testament or an oracle, but nearly every modern man is superior to the sheet he reads. I saw in a frivolous weekly sheet the other day a sheet full of ballet girls and sporting baronets, a cunning little paragraph that said something like, we wonder whether Mr. H. G. Wells is still so enthusiastic for Fabian socialism as he says. We have heard there may soon be news of some little rift in the lute, which by and by, etc., etc. Now suppose I was the editor of a smart society paper. Dressing the part would be fun. And suppose I kept on writing things like this. A little bird has told us that Mr. Winston Churchill may not always be found on the conservative benches, and that should he transfer his allegiance to the liberals, they may even find office for him. Or, the market was fluttered this morning on account of the startling rumor that Dr. Jameson was contemplating a raid and had actually invaded President Kruger's territory. We shall keep our readers early informed, etc. Or, there is a whisper in smart circles that a wife will soon be found for the young king of Spain. Some say that the actual lady is, etc. Or, as we go to press, we hear that Lord Curzon is contemplating a Durbar, and so on and so on. 
Should I be considered a knowing and up-to-date young dog? I do not know. But I do know that none of the above remarks are of more antediluvian absurdity than the remark about Mr. Wells in that knowing little paper that I described above. Mr. Wells never was a socialist in a full Fabian sense, and never pretended to be. He was specially the critic of the official Fabian policy. He wrote faults of the Fabians so long ago that it whitens my hair to think of it. Then he definitely divided himself from the whole thing, giving his theoretic reasons. Since then, he has battered the Fabian society in book after book, so that it is almost impossible to open a new novel by him without seeing, as it were, the face of some Fabian snapshotted by a flash of lightning at a most unfortunate moment for him. Moreover, he explained all this himself in an article in The New Witness, and doubtless in many other places. Yet the very special kind of paper whose only plea in extenuation of its sins must be that it can catch the flying tale of the new rumour, has not even heard of the beginnings of this ancient tale. This is not an isolated case. I saw in a similar society organ something about Mr. Lloyd George and his friend Mr. Lansbury, with whom, apparently, he is united, not only, of course, by the wild romance of rapacious socialism and frantic popularity, but also by the unclouded affection of two companions in arms. Yet this was several months after the two men had nearly fought each other in Parliament with a passion unknown in that place. When Mr. Lansbury talked about a Marconi secret, and Mr. George about a foul lip. This is a curious paradox, that the articles that almost profess to be prophecies are out of date even as historics. It would be an exaggeration to say that their one permanent poster is that Queen Anne is dead. But they do not seem to be able to get much further than the news that Queen Victoria is ill. This suggests another mode of testing the matter, which has always struck me as very remarkable. It is within my own experience that I have always heard the most interesting and exciting debates about the destiny and policy of modern institutions, either by being present at them or by hearing of them from my friends. Of next to none of them do I owe my knowledge to the newspapers. Here I must anticipate and avert a misunderstanding, especially about what I mean by exciting debates. The upholder of the existing journalistic conventions may imagine that I mean to say the debate on the raising of the age for school attendance between Mr. Pidge, XCC, and Dr. Gurner was more truly momentous than the paltry party struggles, or the destiny of Europe will be more lastingly affected by this decision of the general of the Jesuits about early rising than by any recent political events. To this sort of thing, of course, he will have his usual reply. We write for the public. The public knows and cares nothing about sciences, educational or theological. The public would not listen, etc. But I do not mean things of that kind, things that can only indirectly, as a point of private conviction, be called exciting. I mean things that really are exciting, in the perfectly plain and popular sense of the word. And I say, it is as much bad journalism to miss the difference or conflict between Mr. Bernard Shaw and Mr. H. G. Wells, as it would be bad journalism to miss the conflict 
between Sayers and Enam. Even according to the crude and rather fantastic popular representations of the two men, the idea of their collision would be as entertaining to the public as that of Mephistopheles and the Man of the Moon. Yet we have seen how little the light press of the time ever even knew that their types of socialism were different. A much stronger case can be found in the great socialist duel between Juarez and Bibel many years ago. It was a scene as crucial and historic as Luther before his examiners, or Robespierre, shouted down by the revolutionists. But the English papers did it no justice, and I first heard the point of it from a man who happened to be there. It was nothing less than the resurrection of nationality in Europe. The Socialist Congress had begun, as such Congresses always do begin, with a sort of prayer to nothing in particular, beseeching it, whatever it was, to keep the peace of Europe and preserve, above all, the social solidarity of the proletarians of all lands. France was nothing. Germany was nothing. Humanity was everything. Before the end of that debate, the two greatest socialists alive were taunting each other about Bismarck and Napoleon, about flags and barricades. Will anyone say patriotism is unpopular? Will anyone say France and Germany are things the public has never heard of? No. It is only the unworldly journalist who has never heard of them. G. K. Chesterton End Section 4 Read by Carrie Adams Your Book Voice At Mesa, Arizona on 30th of October, 2021. End of G.K. Chesterton in the British Review by G.K. Chesterton